All right. Stephen Burke, off, off to you. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Good morning. So interesting times we're living in. Uh, <clears throat> a lot going on, and it usually involves a lot of news and a lot of dollars. So I want to cover a couple things right now. And Nancy Lazar, who came on and spoke last summer, I guess, <clears throat> came out this week with a projection that uh, U.S. real GDP growth for 2021 could reach, uh, could be between 8 and 9%. Uh, possibly going to 10%. To put that in perspective, uh, the last time we saw an 8% GDP growth was 1983. The last time we saw a 9% GDP growth was 1959. So uh, the recovery is certainly underway, but uh, as we know, it has been uneven. It is starting to broaden out. I wanna to touch on two areas, the CBO report and the 1.9 trillion relief bill that was put through. So. The CBO is, um, provides, is the Congressional Budget Office, provides the government with uh, forecasts based on the rules on the books as they stand. So this is from their uh, a recent report as their economic forecast through 2030, it covers four areas, real GDP, consumer price, inflation, unemployment, and the 10-year treasury. What's interesting is even for uh, the near term, they're projecting half of what Nancy's projecting in terms of GDP growth. Um, probably a little bit more aggressive in terms of the uh, unemployment rate improving. Uh, a little lower level of inflation than, uh, well, actually a, a lot lower, higher level than inflation than a lot of people are projecting right now. And then the 10 year is, uh, certainly in, in an interesting uh, projection, but moving back towards more normal levels in uh, by 2030. So I wanna to move to a report they did that takes it out to 2051. And as you can see here, uh, you get a look at um, public debt, uh, federal debt held by the public, which is going to exceed 200% of GDP by 2051. Uh, they also do a 30-year projection, so the next numbers I'm going to give you are the 30-year projection. But for historical perspective, we're already at a very high level of, uh, of debt to GDP for, held by the public, and look where it's projected to go. So we do have a debt issue. Um, this highlights where the deficits are, and the deficit numbers are interesting. So <clears throat> we're looking at basically uh, projecting out the largest, uh, uh, second largest uh, debt to GDP this year of 10.3%. Um, and that, I'm sorry, the deficit is 10.3%. That's the second largest since 1945. The largest was last year. Looking out uh, going forward by 2031, they're projecting 5.7% of uh, deficit to GDP and by 2050 up to 13%. What's really interesting though is interest costs, net interest cost and their impact because right now they're running about one to 2%. Uh, they'll be 2% by 2031, but that number goes to 9% of GDP by 2051 if we don't get our uh, debt under control. And you have to figure, I have to go into what the assumptions they use for interest costs are there. But if you're looking at the numbers I gave you on the, uh, pages before, by 2030, they're looking at three to 4%. So you can just project out that those are gonna be pretty high. Um, so def net interest is gonna be a problem and getting our uh, deficits uh, in order is gonna be an issue because we have to get our debt more manageable. What's interesting when you look at this, this is the outlays versus revenues for that same period. And the outlays really start to ratchet up and there's three big areas major healthcare programs being one net interest in social security. I saw a number on uh, Medicare cost and then Medicare fund actually is uh, towards the uh, running out needs to be refurbished, but um, there were 61.2 million beneficiaries on Medicare in 2019. 
by 2030, that's projected to be 80 million. So up another just shy of 19 million. And you can just see that continue to ratchet up as we get out to 2050. So you're seeing this here with the age group by population. Uh, I'm sorry, the population by age group and at the different levels. And you can really see the ratcheting up of the um, 65 and older uh, number. But what's so fascinating about this is where the demographic factors have to be come into to make this happen. And it really is all around um, net migration driving it because our birth death rates will be moving to negative around uh, 2042. But even throughout this whole process, getting our immigration policy right in the US, and I would argue immigration policies around the world will be one of the determining factors for economic success that'll play a much bigger role going forward because we have these population mismatches, population growth mismatches between the developed economies, including China and Japan uh, and the US. Other than India and Brazil of the top 10, all major economies are in population declines or at population levels where they're not really growing to sustain their own economy without immigration being a bigger factor. So I think these are uh, important uh, numbers to be aware of and to keep in mind as we move forward and as the debates go, because uh, the next round after the stimulus is or relief program is gonna be infrastructure and that's gonna play into the deficits and how we pay for it all. And growth at 9%, which for, for this year will be great, but that's not a, not a sustainable number. Um, even China's talking about growing at, uh, at a minimum level of 6%. I would expect they'll probably come in around uh, 7 or 8% this year when all said and done, but they're trying to slow down their growth to make it more manageable. The U.S. has hyper growth this year. That's going to come down as well um, because sooner or later the, the bills come due for all this. So very important that we keep an eye on the immigration policy and getting that right. And I would argue that the debate has been all wrong in the United States for the last couple of years about um, how we're handling Im illegal immigrants and the like. And it really should be on how do we get the right immigration policy that supports the economic needs that we have as well as the social needs that we have to move the economy forward. We need more people paying in to the system to uh, and getting greater taxes to deal with these problems. <clears throat> so President Biden shifting gears to the uh, 1.9 trillion stimulus package. Um, or, the original plan from President Biden was to come out at this 1.889 figure. The Senate GOP was looking for 600, and now we know that the House and the Senate will, are close to passing almost 1.9 trillion. The main changes of that bill were in this uh, minimum wage and also in the how the unemployment was uh, delivered. But I wanna just cover a couple of the big issues here quickly. So minimum wage proposal was out. There were eight senators on the Democratic side that were not supportive of it. It wasn't just Manchin, it was several others. Um, so that's out of the bill now. Although I think corporations are gonna step up and do what they can to start moving to that level so that they, uh, are getting the right workers as well as managing their process. But for a lot of the small businesses that are coming back from the pandemic, that $15 could be crippling for them. So that's gonna be one that's gonna to be tough to interesting to watch. The unemployment benefits reduced from 400 to $300 a week, but they also extended the benefit period by a week. So that actually <clears throat> has the same effect in terms of economic value. Um, then they adjusted for individuals earning less than $150,000 and filing taxes um, and individuals earning less than 150 dollars and filing taxes will not owe on the first $10,020 of unemployment benefits that they get. So that's actually another benefit for them. Stimulus checks were adjusted to uh, bring it down. So 8.7 million fewer households will be receiving checks under these changes, but COBRA benefits were enhanced um, from 85% to 100%. So that's going to be an offset there. <clears throat> and they changed the timing and use of the funds for state and local aid. So you can't use it for tax cuts. You can't shore up your pensions. Um, it can only be for pandemic-related expense and shortfalls and 
uh, to pay for some investments that are critical need investments in water, sewage, and broadband. So there were some subtle shifts that I think are really um, uh, quite helpful and thoughtful in terms of uh, mitigating some of the concerns that people had, if you can say that for a $1.9 trillion spend. Other items are <laughs> the gig economy. Uh, they may, uh, included a permanent change to impact gig workers by um, reducing their reported income threshold to from 20,000 to 600. So that's a big change there. Um, they're expected to pick up 9 billion over the decade. And then the student loans um, are still gonna be played out, but uh, they included a provision to eliminate any tax consequences for the forgiveness through 2025. Otherwise, the forgiveness would be counted as income. Um, President Biden would like Congress to pass a law um, for giving up to 10,000. Um, they want it done through law rather than executive action for the permanence of it, um, still to be debated there. Um, they did some other things to help out the certain industries that they thought needed more help. Uh, the restaurant industry picked up another 3.6 uh, billion the uh, rural healthcare providers got 8.5 and uh, another uh, just under 3 billion for aid to non-public schools. So <clears throat> a lot going on and hard to imagine that uh, after we just did a $900 billion uh, stimulus in the fourth quarter that we're about to introduce another one. This 1.9 is not factored into the numbers I just went through with the um, CBO because they will only put it on after it becomes law. Uh, so there are a lot of puts and takes in this. Um, I would say that if you dig into the stimulus program, there are puts and takes that um, certain of the increases will be offset by changes in the tax law from the Trump um, uh, tax changes, which roll off in 2025. So uh, the CBO will be readjusting the numbers again in uh, a couple months to see what they come up with. But a lot of changes going on, a lot of money being spent. And it's hard to imagine when uh, you're talking about uh, billions of dollars not seeming all that meaningful in light of uh, 1.9 trillion and the amount of money that's been spent so far. But Mark, with that, I'll, uh, a couple key takeaways. Um, what's really interesting about this Senate, uh, this approval, um, is that Biden actually got virtually everything he was looking for in this program. So he is, uh, the Democratic agenda held together better than a lot of people thought it would. Um, deficits have not become the concern yet for politicians, although the markets seem to be taking a different view. Um, and that may be because of their view of relief versus stimulus. The infrastructure bill is going to be, I think, more contentious, even though it's an area that people both agree on. It'll also be up against some deadlines like uh, the summer recess, the uh, debt ceiling has to be looked at, and also the uh, Medicare fund uh, running out of funds needs to be addressed too. The other thing is the Republicans didn't put up a very good fight right now. I think there's a leadership void, a lack of a lack of a vision, or uncertainty about where the party wants to stake, put their stake in the ground. Um, so a lot of the changes came from uh, the Democratic side, with some push from the Republican side. Uh, but this is uh, going to be interesting. Are they setting up really to let Biden get his one big thing through, um, and then really taking the fight to the midterms is going to be the question. But this is definitely a big win for the Biden administration. Um, the, it makes, in my view, the infrastructure plan uh, set up to be much more contentious. So with that, Mark, I'll stop here. Interesting. Questions, comments for, for Stephen? Yeah, Stephen, I can't help but listening, hearing, um, the band play, you know, near my God to thee as you talk, right? Because we're just rearranging chairs on the uh, deck of the Titanic. Um, you, you know, I think the picture you paint on a long term, but you know, nine ten percent is really coming off a horrible last year. So it's not, you know, so, so so the number looks great because it's such a low base that you're working off on the GDP year to year, and nothing you've painted 
looks good, sounds good, feels good from a guy who's run a business. Um, and so I wonder, isn't, isn't, I wonder if, it, if, it, if it's worthwhile to have a, a session or something, Mark, that talks about, you know, short-term investment opportunities, you know, playing the game you know, with, with the Fed, but really on a long-term basis, what, what, you know, what are, what are good long-term uh, investment opportunities given the uh, really poor economic environment as a backdrop that the United States has? Um, uh, you know, I, I sit and I listen to this, and I, th I, th I think of my friends in Texas who talk about buying raw land as, as the place to put money. Um, I'd love to have, you I know. I think you know which Texans you're talking about. And I'd love to have an opinion, uh, you know, or a session talking about really those kind of short term, you know, poker games to be played, but longer term, you know, I don't, it doesn't feel like a growth world we're in right now. And I'm not sure America is a sustainable bet. So I'd love but, to have a session. But talk about we, we, we had this uh, debate, we were, it was at, at the Harvard Club uh, where Arnold was speaking, Stephen, it's sort of like the, the, the cleanest. Uh, clean a shirt in the dirty laundry. Where are you going to mm -hmm. go, Jim? Where are you going where are you going to invest? Is it Asia with the innovation? Is it Europe? Yeah, look, I think it's a, it's, it's it's a great question. I mean, does it push you into an asset class that's more venture capital, high growth, risky because there you have the impression of you can actually make some good bets and and you at least have some organic opportunities there. Uh, as opposed to looking international, right? I mean, going into, you know, China's 6%, 7% growth is probably feels more realistic and organic than a 10% growth in the United States. So, so I wonder, but I-, I, I well, Let's I was, open it up because I'm, because I think that's, that's an interesting discussion. Where, where's, what do you ask, what do you allocate uh, in the midst of all this? So, so uh, I want to throw in my two cents here because I, I used to think the way Jim thought that the, everything was going to hell in a handbasket. And now, because of what I'm happening in my business and, and what I'm seeing is I think this is like 1945. Um, the, the world's going to explode. There was a giant reset button that, would, that took a year to push. Everybody started working from home. You know, Zoom became from nobody even knowing about it to this massive business. Everybody's relooking at supply chains. Everybody's relooking at everything that's possibly going on in the world. And you know, you got SpaceX. You know, ship from I'm just just randomly. You know, SpaceX. Ship, you know, has a taxi up to the ISS now. You have electric cars changing. I think the entire world just hit a giant reset button, and it's like 1945. And you're going to go into the pit. Let's, 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 what, what, Brian, I'm just seeing you nodding over there in Manila. What, what, what does Asia think of all this? You, I know you see yourself, oh, a lot of growth markets around you, a lot of innovation. You're hit less by, less stimulus had to be put in. But um, how do you look at the global economy today? Yeah, I, I do agree that it certainly is a reset you know from from the asian perspective the way we see it like you know the, the last 30 years you have 1989 with the tiananmen massacre then you have the 97 98 nearly a decade after with the sorrows speculating on the bot then you have 07 08 the great financial crisis on the mortgage side that stepped from america and then fast forward another 12 years you get the pandemic so in the way you see it is that history doesn't repeat itself exactly, but it sure does rhyme. And yeah, I do agree that there is really a reset right now, but with every reset, there are also opportunities that abound. You know, digital transformation has accelerated greatly in Asia Pacific and at least by three to five years on adoption. You know, the way we see it is, China has adopted WeChat and Alipay and basically re leapfrogged the West when it comes to fintech, primarily because they were going from a huge unbanked population, roughly 70%, and they basically skipped the brick and mortar phase and went straight to the mobile phones. 
And that trend is also mimicked in the emerging markets, including Vietnam, I would say Philippines and, you know, emerging Asia. And the pandemic, with everybody being stuck at home, just accelerated this trend. So there are winners and losers, clearly. Brick and mortar, you know, the deceleration is accelerated. But at the same time, you do see winners in this space. I mean, of course, Zoom is an obvious one. Like, as mentioned, it was mostly in the PE, VC community that we were using Zoom prior to the pandemic. And now even my wife, who's an educator, uses it every day, more than I do. Yeah, so there really is a as a shift but i think that you know it's uh, the cards are being reshuffled and those that are playing their hand for the next game of poker will be the ones who will win at the end of the day yeah, and so that's our view but give me a little geopolitical view then i mean we talked at our last uh monthly allocation asset allocation group that europe really s did not uh show its best colors over the last 12 months uh, and it's not innovating, and it ha handled it handled the pandemic, uh, you know, not effectively. We didn't handle it effectively, but we innovate. Uh, well, the UK innovated uh, to some extent, but as you say, that should, if if you're if you're an endowment, I'm just looking at like Todd Rupert, who's on the the, the board uh, at uh, INSEAD with its campus in in in, C in Singapore. You know, does we talked about in September, if you remember, Todd whether we should be shifting to China. It just seems like Eurasia broadly, it just feels like Asia's winning in a big way. What do you think, Todd? You're on, you're on mute though. Oh, still on mute. Sorry, I'm, I'm mute, sorry. Uh, yeah, a lot of activity there. I mean, you just take a look at uh, what China's done in the venture capital space, you know, from virtually nothing uh, a while ago to almost 50% of the venture activity globally. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of interesting things happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm surprised we haven't seen SPAC activity out there. Yeah. They're too busy getting them out in the U.S. first before they that's take what, it that's out where, there. That's where we innovate, right? <laughs> um, Hey, Mark, I got, a, I got a question about Southeast Asia since we're talking about it in, in China. D does anyone else... Has anyone else ever looked at the correlations between U.S. technology sector in Southeast Asia and China? I guess, in, in my view, when I look at those areas, with the exception of Brazil, which isn't, I know it's different, but a lot of it's highly correlated to U.S. tech. And so if this NASDAQ sell-off has any type of legs to it, and if there is a pullback in some of the other tech companies here, especially in China, I mean, what is the investment thesis going forward then if we see a true reversal in U.S. technology? Well, there is a consumer. Value, right, Mark? You can look at value. Oh, I mean, in terms of our, our U.S. markets. Uh, yeah, I was value, about the, the age of the way. How yeah. we made a value market, I would think. Other thoughts? I would just step I, back I, to I have, I have, I'm just looking for it here on my desk. I can't seem to locate it, but I've got some data that I can ship out to you, Mark, and you can get it to folks. Okay. Mark, I think the big answers to Jim's question are around innovation and how do we manage the debt globally? Because mm -hmm. we have a global debt problem. It's not just a US problem. Um, and you look at Japan, you know, is the best example of it. The, the issue is going to be can innovation create a growth rate that's high enough to allow us to manage our debt? It's whether you're a household, a corporation, or a government. That's really going to be the issue is, are your, are your revenues growing at a rate that allows you to manage your debt down? And I think those, those two issues, and I think the innovation one, um, as Simon talked about with 5G, I don't think we've seen the innovation from 5G yet. We've heard of the promise of it, but the reality is when 5G is really fully deployed and you can start to see the benefits of AI more fully integrated into it, and then you're gonna be moving to even higher levels of commute, compute power that's gonna change the way we think about things. So I, I continue to be very positive on the ability of leading nations to innovate, but I think there are only a few that are driving that and that's the US, China uh, and, and uh, Korea and a few other areas around the world that are really driving the innovation. <clears throat> Canada has a nice uh, uh, tech hub developing in, in a couple different areas 
France has been trying to make a commitment to it. But I think the innovation is going to be what people continue to underestimate as what is going to drive us forward. And, uh, and that is going to be a game changer. So I would keep focusing on the innovation. I think value is an interesting opportunity in the short term, but I think those companies are don't have the uh, running uh, the, the bandwidth behind them to to make the transition as effectively as uh, growth companies can. So I it's think an interesting it's point, I think, Stephen, because as I think, sit and think about innovation and what it means relative to the the cost curve and what that means and the upside down uh, demographics on one of the slides that you had. And what that means from a cost growth perspective, you know, somehow you've got, and it's, and, and, and it's a pretty elaborate economic model that looks at innovation and productivity growth and economic growth and those curves uh, relative to the cost curve of, of debt and, and, and underlying that debt demographics and, and you know, and, and, uh, and not just age demographics, but, you know, student loan demographics and and all these other things that, you know, to me, you know, can innovation outrun that that slope of that cost curve? And that's really what we're talking about here. And I certainly don't have the data or maybe the gray matter to figure that out, but I think that's underlying your comment. You know, yeah. in, innovation in and of itself uh, has to outrun that. So can I ch chime in? Uh, with a couple of comments. Just a, um, just a couple. So, of just, just, we've got to, we've got to, right. Yeah. So number one, I agree with the gentleman who uh, mentioned that we're like in uh, 1945 like um, uh, moment. My sense is that um, if we paraphrase it, we're in the um, we, we entered the late um, adoption process of um, industrial of the fourth industrial revolution which basically means that uh, before there were 10 15 percent of people and businesses which were able to adapt it and now we're probably at 30 percent um, plank so we're right about the point when we will accelerate and all the rails which were laid down in the past uh, three years and especially during pandemic um, I'm not, I, I don't think that they are valued properly. I think the market undervalues, I agree with Stephen, uh, the speed at which innovation will take off from here. Um, so I think uh, this concept, James, so what you are saying is a, a concept of productivity uh, will be answered uh, very, very uh, nicely. We will see all the small companies exploding SPACs will bring them capital and uh, at the same time we'll see a huge adoption of different new technologies uh, in all the industries as well and all of this will be happening in the next two three years thanks uh, and Simon if I could just add to that there that's coming at a time there is massive cash on the sidelines being ready to be put to work money market funds in the U.S. have over five trillion dollars Consumers, because of savings, are have an estimated two trillion dollars to spend. Um, and and you're, you're right with the SPACs and other things. There is new money, uh, new opportunities being created. So I think when you take all those together, that actually creates this near-term issue, but uh, that's going to provide a lot of stimulus and growth to the system. What happens longer term, though, has to be through <clears throat> innovation and. Uh, lowering costs and, and the like. And I think you're seeing that already in the manufacturing areas and other areas. So it, it will drive innovation, keeping costs down and keeping inflation in check to allow the uh, global system to heal the debt problem. So uh, we want to speak, we've had a lot of discussion about innovation. And uh, obviously the, today we're going to talk about that in spades um, and how to best invest into it. Um, there's just one uh, thing I, before I turn it over to you, Tino, um, that we did want to allow uh, Anand, can you just speak a, a bit of uh, this before about what we're going to do in, in ag tech on Thursday? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'll, I'll give a really quick uh, overview. You know, it's great to be talking about innovation. And I think the ag tech event is going to be particularly focused on 
uh, scalable innovation in, in, in a few key areas. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm um, friends with uh, Ephraim Lindenbaum, who's, uh, you know, I, I can confidently say I'm, I'm probably the, the dumbest person in this, this lineup here uh, because Ephraim is, uh, has been in the clean tech, ag tech, um, venture capital space. He's based out of Silicon Valley. He's, he lectures at Stanford and he's a board member at Front Range Biosciences, which is basically taking existing tissue culture and genetics um, processes and applying it to cannabis. Although he'll be talking more broadly as well about other ag tech applications. Uh, and I'll just highlight uh, Richard Lackey as well, who um, uh, connected with more recently, but um, you know, a lot of the solutions they're focused on in ag tech are solutions that can change the international supply chain, especially around uh, food uh, and, um, and access to quality food in, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be part of that. I think it'll be a great discussion. I think a lot of the key parts of that event will be audience participation. So hope hope uh, everybody can join uh, because uh, I want to really pick their brains and get to know um, how they're thinking about scalable ag tech innovation. So we always leave five minutes for a welcome. That was sort of a five minutes of a transition. Um, but uh, it, so those who are new to us, you know, I will just maybe show we have a lot of events. <laughs> um, these are just, in fact, Anon is is Mr. Anon and, and, and Simon Vine are competing for how many events they can host. So, <laughs> um, and he's got uh, another growth area, obviously, with, with, with cannabis, Simon with 5G. And we are trying to help the world. Um, and we're gonna, we've just actually launched, and I'll show it in the chat, that you when you come to 361, you can onboard not only your family office, your fund, your deal, but also your plan. So that's uh, important to us. So little technical reminders. And again, this is the calendar. And I am, uh, you know, what I love is like my, my lawyer and uh, tells me that we don't really plant seeds, we fertilize soil so that people can, you know, grow whatever they need to grow here and um, including the ecosystems or sub ecosystems and in venture, I've been careful. I'm careful because my, my fingers are burnt from so many, you know, I, I am that statistic. I'm probably better than the statistic, it's, but I'm emotionally scarred from my venture investing. And what really launched 361 was not, not only with the alumni networking that I was doing and being in a family office, but I, I started to work with some venture funds. I think that's this, a, a, you know, and those who are systematic on venture, I think so many family offices or high net worth get their fingers burnt like I do. Um, but I'm back in. I'm excited. We're all excited. We just, we just want to be smarter, systematic. So thus, you know, today's event um, with a great group of people like Alain and Anissa who have funds or Kim who's been investing across uh, with, particularly with an impact angle or Looney, what he's doing, um, to keep on hearing. And what I really like is a lot of connectivity from our, from even though there are everybody, many of them are new, um, there's a lot of connectivity which shows that this is uh, that we're a good fit for each other. So.